Good morning. Welcome to our service. It's uh, September the 10th. Uh, and although you may see me here, I'm actually not here this morning. I'm uh, simply going to uh, Inglesby and Lachlan and staying at Lachlan for a while this morning. And uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, uh, we have no technician to run the stream today. So if you're interested in that job, <laughs> we're certainly open to uh, people volunteering and, and coming forward. Nobody was available today. So uh, we're going to run a service from three years ago, which is essentially um, what you would have, would have happened today live, roughly, uh, so very much the same. So hopefully you'll enjoy and stay with us today. Um, and if all goes well, we're going to uh, record Barb Fawcett. She's uh, speaking here today, and we'll post that uh, hopefully later on. And if you want to see, um, hear Barb's message, uh, there you go. We appreciate everyone for continuing to watch and support us. Um, God bless. It's about 10.30, close enough. Uh, welcome to our streaming slash service from the Halliburton Pastoral Charge, which uh, includes Lachlan United Church, Inglesby United Church, and Halliburton United Church. And this is happening here at the uh, library at the Halliburton United Church. So welcome, welcome back. So pleased that people come back to, uh, to watch this, to participate in this. And uh, it's, it's, it's a way when we are not getting together face to face to, to worship, to, uh, to pray, to pray collectively, to, uh, to listen to God's word, um, to do many of the things we, uh, we usually do on Sunday, except we're not together yet but I'm going to get to that. Uh, so thanks for joining us, and thanks so many people, uh, many of you, if not all of you, are supporting this ministry with your, uh, with financial help, and we, uh, we have, I keep putting up every week the way to do that, but I think pretty much everybody seems to know how they want to do that, and we, we really appreciate that. All three churches are, are being supported, and let's pray. Lord, we uh, praise you and thank you for your grace, your love, for this day that you've given to us and the gifts that you've bestowed upon us. And in particular, the gift of Jesus, who is our Savior, our King, our Lord, uh, our constant companion and friend, who laid down his life for us that we might be forgiven and delivered and healed. Jesus Christ, we are your people. And we give you thanks for all that you've done for us. And Lord, you've commanded us and called us to pray for one another and pray for the needs around us. And we do so with faith. And we put all these names and situations in your hands. So we pray for healing and help and, uh, and comfort and strength, uh, whatever might be needed. Jesus. And be with us as we worship today, as we listen to your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and lead us in the right paths. For we ask it in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, um, Melissa has prepared a a prelude for us today, and it's uh, it's not a song that I knew. Uh, it's called "Soon and Very Soon," um, and it's uh, it's by Andre Crouch. I didn't know this song in particular, but I really knew Andre Crouch. I was a really big fan of Andre Crouch back in the '70s, and I actually got to hear him live uh, in uh, uh, I think it was Varsity Stadium in Toronto back in about probably '75. Uh, so uh, just a great. Uh, man filled with the spirit, great songwriter. Um, some of the, his pieces you, you, you may well know. We used to sing one, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. Uh, we should bring that one back, I think. But Andre Crouch, he's a great piano player. Always had a, a nice bunch of people singing and playing with him. Uh, and so he wrote this. Melissa plays this, but and I put some of the words to it, uh, just so it, soon and very soon. He often talked about the return of Christ, which is a great important Christian doctrine that at some point Jesus will return with power and will go be with him forever and uh, you know he will he will bring he will, he will bring this world uh, put it all to rights and so we look forward to that day and this is it's according to Andre Crouch soon and very soon
Thanks, Melissa. That was a very uh, real, the flavor of Andre Crouch and, and his style of playing was, was, was in there. Uh, so, uh, great piece. We are going to sing together. Um, uh, this is kind of experimental a little bit, but uh, and I'm the only one singing in it, and I'm a little loud, I know, so remember that if it's too loud or too soft, use your television or computer uh, volume control, because this is not a professional um, gathering, turn, turn up or turn down. So this is John, John Menzies doing the piano, and I'm doing guitar and voice, and uh, we're going to do Days of Elijah. Days of Elijah. Let's sing together. These are the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses' righteousness being restored And though these are days of great trial Oh, of famine and darkness and sword So we are the voice in the desert Crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, sing here of jubilee, for out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Days of Ezekiel, these are the days of Ezekiel dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, woo, the fields are as white in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, Shining like the sun at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation come. Days of Elijah. Days of Elijah. First time we played that now in 25 weeks. Uh, so, we're going to have scripture reading. We're heavily, we've got some uh, strong representation from Inglesby today because John, that was John Menzies playing the piano in, in that last piece. Plus, now we're going to have Shirley Venner from Inglesby reading the scripture at the Inglesby Church. So, the scripture is Matthew 18, 15 to 20, but she will tell you that. But now you know, in case you have a Bible handy. Uh, here we go. Good morning from Inglesby United Church. The first scripture reading today is from Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. I'm reading from the Good News Bible. The passage is entitled, A Brother Who Sins. If your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. But do it privately, just between yourselves. If he listens to you, you have won your brother back. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two other persons with you, so that every accusation may be upheld by the testimony of two or more witnesses, as the scripture says. And if he will not listen to them, then tell the whole thing to the church. Finally, if he will not listen to the church, treat him as though he were a pagan or a tax collector. And so I tell all of you, what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. 
And I tell you more, whenever two of you on earth agree about anything you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, I am there with them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Shirley. Shirley's watching this morning, so you got to see yourself. It's a little nerve-wracking to do that with nobody, nobody right there, isn't it? Um, okay, let us continue to worship the Lord as we present our offerings. Oh, oh, hi, Phil. Where's my? Oh, there it is. Beth, thank you. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. We shall sing one of many of our favorite uh, songs, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. The tune itself was written by Johann Sebastian Bach uh, in the early 1800s. Um, and the song a little later was applied to, this, uh, to that tune. And uh, yeah, so uh, let's, uh, let's sing Joyful, Joyful together. Where are you? Joyful, joyful, we adore you. God of glory, Lord of love. That's our God. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for gathering us together today, virtually, from 
homes scattered far and wide, that we might worship you. We thank you not only for this opportunity, but for all our brothers and sisters worldwide who are meeting in this, this manner uh, and others who are beginning to get together. Lord, bless your church. Make us, keep us faithful to you and open our hearts to your voice and your word that as we consider what it is to be the church, we would uh, maybe have some more insight and encouragement from your spirit. And we lift our time to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I saw this, uh, it was kind of a, a partial documentary, I guess, and it was an interview of uh, some young people, uh, and they were asked a question, just kind of randomly in the States, what do you think of the church? What do you think of the church? And this one woman, uh, who was probably college age, 18 to, to 22, something like that, she said this, and I wrote it down word for word. Uh, uh, it, was, it wasn't written, but it, she, she said it, because it's recorded, you can do that. She said, in all honesty, I tend to think that any kind of group worship is pretty unnecessary because religion is pretty personal, and in the end, I think it's kind of creepy, like a cult. Boy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, she, she's probably representative of a lot of the thinking of a lot of people, perhaps, particularly perhaps of her generation, who have very little, if any, experience of church in our society, which is becoming more and more common. And um, right, and she, you know, so she she may have not in well not encountered Christ yet, uh, and uh, she may not have been a part of a church. She may not know the scriptures, but being that as it may, it just gives us a little bit of insight into the fact that we have a bit of an uphill climb as the church. Uh, in sort of telling people who we are. They're kind of afraid of what we're all about, apparently. Um, and, you know, that's a sentiment, but one, part of what she said, I mean, lots we could dig into about what she said, but uh, I think that sentiment is very strong in our world today, that, that, that faith or spirituality is, is a personal thing. It's a private thing. And... Uh, and the whole idea of doing something communally, getting together and doing something is not really necessary. I can, I've got it, I can do it by myself. And everybody's got their own thoughts, etc. Et that's, that's a common perception. But this passage that we've got before us today tells us a, a bit of a different story, doesn't it? Uh, and this, this passage tells us why that gathering, the, uh, Jesus the, the second time now uses the word ecclesia, uh, why this gathering, and we're, we're, we're doing it now, we're gathering virtually, it's not quite the same, but, it, but why it is necessary, why it is necessary, why it is important. Um, and the first piece, the first part of it, uh, I'm going to read it to you just again, uh, Shirley read it out of the uh, uh, Good News Bible, I'm going to read it out of the, the newer New International Version. Uh, just this first part. This is verse 15, I guess. Uh, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's a direct quote from the, from the Law of Moses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church... Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, shun them, kind of cut them off your, your fellowship. Whoa! So that's... Uh, and the, so this, these three verses are what have commonly been called uh, the church discipline or spiritual discipline, I suppose. Uh, Christian discipline. And it's a bit of an ominous subject. So I... I, I with some dear degree of trepidation, uh, enter upon the... Un, into the field here, um, you know, we, we, we realize that to what, for, we hope at least that churches, uh, the churches are meant to be oases, that's the plural of oasis, uh, of grace, uh, oases of grace and of, of communion with God, uh, of fellowship with, with one another, of understanding and compassion and shared love. Uh, but some, sometimes that's what they're supposed to be, but sometimes they can be scary places of emotional abuse and even uh, brainwashing, manipulation, etc. And, uh, and so often that happens in the name of spiritual discipline. 
I read a, a thing in uh, this magazine I read a lot, Christianity Today, um, uh, this, this little news clip from a few years ago. An Oklahoma pastor spent five minutes of Sunday worship calling out parishioners by name for their flaws, including sleeping. You're one of the, quote, you're one of the sorriest church members I have. You're not worth 15 cents, unquote, said Jim Standridge, pastor of Skiatooks Emmanuel Baptist Church to one attendee. Can <laughs> you imagine? <laughs> oh my goodness. So that's, I mean, that's, that's abusive. I mean, it's shaming people in front of everybody, you know, in a public, in a public way. Uh, and th this subject is, is close to my experience because uh, I attended a church for years that I would have to say did this kind of thing. Um, there was an abusiveness and a, you know, a manipulativeness about it. And uh, on, the out, on the outside, it looked like any other church pretty much. I mean, you know, they had normal Christian worship, uh, Christian kind of liturgy and prayers and preaching and Bible reading and lots of music. Then afterwards they would have circle time. And when I first started going there, it was, it was, it was kind of fun. You would, they would kind of listen to you, you you'd get a chance to share. So people, people could share their stories or share something. Uh, it was supposed to be quite biblical. But after you were there a while, people started to call one another. It, it turned out you get, you could get called out. Like you're in the flesh or you're, you're not, you're not being real. You're, uh, you're just talking about yourself. So people began to be afraid, myself included, uh, to say anything, but we felt we had to, we'd push ourselves. It was, uh, it was pretty traumatic in many ways and uh, produced fear. And so, so I can understand why that kind of thing would, puts people off or they hear about it. They think, is that what church is about? Because it's this partic that particular version that I experienced is just one of many different kinds of ways in which people seem to be getting judged, or they feel they'll be they'll be uh, they'll be intimidated somehow when they're supposed to be being accepted and loved. Um, so yeah. <laughs> uh, so what do we do with this? This passage from Jesus, he says, if someone sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Now that's it's not something we're very comfortable doing. A lot of the time, if somebody does something to us, uh, you know, 80% of the time, they don't know they've, they've done it. We, we may be simmering and upset and, and kind of steaming, but they have no, no awareness that we've been offended or upset at all. So Jesus is saying, if you know, there's now a rift between you and in your friendship and your fellowship and your communion with one another and the intimacy that you used to enjoy. Now there's a break in it, so you need to go talk it out with them. Um, interesting. Uh, so, so there's some principles in here in this passage. I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail. So there's, there's the three levels. You know, uh, there's just between you and that person. If they don't listen to you, take a couple more. If they don't listen to them, take you know, tell it to the whole church. Um, and I'm still struggling with this because I've had some bad experiences of it, uh, and I know that that's all too common. So we have to learn to do this somehow with a lot more sensitivity, a lot more grace, a lot more love. But some of the principles involved here are huge. Jesus wants us to be reconciled to each other. He wants us to maintain uh, our relationships with one another. And he's saying to us, take the initiative. If there's something off in the relationship, don't just simmer there upset with someone and they don't even know why. Take the initiative and go and talk to them. Now, he, he also says the, the other side of the coin, if you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, which is just a few chapters earlier, he says, you know, if you go to give, to, to, to give, put, I think it's lay your gift at the altar, and you remember that someone has something against you, your, your brother or your sister, go and make it right with them, and then offer your gift. So that's the other side. If you realize, oh, I did something to someone else, I offended them, I hurt them, I, you know, I, I've done something abusive or, you know, uh, sinful, um, inconsiderate, uh, you know, demeaning, whatever the case may be. He says, go, go make it right with them. So he, he's, he says, take it from both sides. You take the initiative. You and I are to take the initiative to guard relationships with our Christian brothers and sisters in particular. Uh, so that's one, one principle that's very much in this passage, and Jesus is emphasizing it. Um, a second principle that is built into this is that Christ is after holy lives. 
He's after us to lead holy lives. And we need to help each other do that. <laughs> now that seems weird a little bit, but uh, and holy, it, you know, holy does not mean, oh, I'm so holy, I never talk to anybody, uh, I'm way better than everybody. That's not, that's not scriptural holiness. Ho I mean, Jesus was holy, and he was the humblest man that ever walked the earth. Uh, so it, it's about humility, it's about joy, it's especially it's about love, it's about compassion, it's about generosity, um, it's about uh, being people of peace, peacemakers, uh, it's about you know caring about the needs of others. That's more what holiness is about than, rather than, than uh, someone who has kept themselves from uh, being contaminated by others. <laughs> that's a, that's a, a misidea of it, a wrong idea. Uh, and he, this passage is saying we need to help each other, and we do. Um, it, I, have, I find it's helpful just to get together with uh, Christian brothers and sisters. Often I just start spending time with them, and something that's maybe a little bit off in my soul or in my spirit or in my thinking or in my feelings comes to light. Uh, somehow getting together with one another uh, brings those things to light and say, oh, there's something off that I didn't realize. It was unconscious to me. And now I need to, to deal with it and grapple with it and perhaps repent or, or, or pray about it till I, till I get it straightened out. So just actually getting together with one another has an effect uh, on guarding us in the path. I mean, Jesus, Jesus kind of talked about this when he talked about washing each other's feet. You know, he said to his disciples, you know, he washed their feet. He said, I want you to wash each other's feet. You're clean, all of you are clean, but your feet get a little dirty. So you need to wa keep washing each other's feet, serving each other. Um, it, it takes, there's a saying, it takes a village to raise a child, which I think is a, a good truth, a truth, but it takes a church to form a Christian. It takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a church to form a Christian. Um, holiness. Holiness comes from rubbing shoulders with each other, learning to love each other, learning to forgive each other. Uh, understanding our own uh, gifts on the one hand, but also the, our, our own weaknesses on the other hand. We do that when we rub up against one another. Uh, and because, this is point three in this bit, the church is meant to be the forerunner of what will be. The church is meant to be the forerunner of what, what will be. It's the prototype of heaven. <laughs> it's, and he heaven is not so much a place as it's a society. It's a, it's a place where... A society of mutual love, of respect, uh, uh, of, uh, of perfect peace and, and, uh, and joy, of people in peace, in shalom, the Hebrew word is shalom, where, where everything is in order, everything is in harmony. So a society of people who are living in shalom around the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the living God. He's at the center of everything. But we, this community, are, are, are gathered around him in sharing in his, his love uh, by loving one another. But that's to be happening, that's what the church is, the gathering. Ecclesia means, uh, means the gathering, the getting together. Which brings me to, uh, kind of to the point, maybe we do need to be together. I mean, th th this, this, is, this passage is used, and not wrongly, for an argument that we need to be more person-to-person -to -person together. I mean, virtual is better than nothing, <laughs> and it helps. But, uh, we are we, we are embodied when we get together person to person face to face it's incarnational Jesus came incarnationally to be God in the flesh among us uh, all that being said you know weighed against the dangers of a, a pandemic so that's uh, that's a bit about that uh, this you know the church discipline thing it's really for out of love it's for it's that we might be a holy people uh, verse 19 says, oh, where'd it go? Truly I tell you, uh, whatever, oh no, I'm going to, again, I truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Uh, so this is a promise from Jesus, which concerns prayer. I mean, there are many promises about prayer, and there's, there's nothing wrong, and it's perfectly, comm it's commanded that we pray by ourselves for various needs. But Jesus, in this, this particular verse, is commending to us the praying together, where two or more get together. 
I, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. It's a powerful promise from Christ that has to do with us commu uh, communally praying, uh, collectively praying, which is why we pray each week. It's a powerful thing to do. So we, we need to be in agreement uh, on those things and people and, and circumstances that we pray for uh, as, we, as we pray to God, because there's extra power in it when we do it together. Um, I'm just going to flip my chart and my teleprompter here. Oh, I went the wrong way. Technology. <laughs> Verse 20, For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Uh, so Jesus is telling us, and not that he isn't with us all the time. You know, he is. He lives in our heart. If we live in, by faith in Christ, Christ actually lives in our, inside our bodies. He, he dwells in us by his spirit. But there's a special way, a more powerful way, that he is with us when we gather together as a community, where two or more gather in his name, which is kind of the definition of the church, I think, where two or more gather in the name of Jesus Christ. So our faith, our faith, our encounter with Jesus is very, per, is very personal, for sure. But to truly follow Jesus is never a private affair. It's a, it's a community thing. Now there's a, uh, a passage from a book, not a very great title to this book, Worship and Mission After Christendom by Kreider and Kreider. So Alan Kreider and Eleanor Kreider, husband and wife, uh, they wrote this book. It was very insightful. And uh, talking about the church, it says, The primary act of Christian worship is meeting with other believers to ascribe worth to God. The very act of gathering, of doggedly, regularly showing up, is immensely important. I love that line. It asserts in an embodied way that this God and this God alone, amidst a plethora of other commitments and possibilities, is worthy of our undivided commitment and allegiance. Further, the act of gathering is a statement that this people rather than other social group groupings, is our primary family. It is diverse in its composition. Some of its members are very different from us. Really. Some of its members we may not like. But we have more reunions with this family than with any genetic family. Any related family. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, there's a lot in this. I'm not going to unpack it too much, but it just, it, he, he's, they are seeking to emphasize to us how important it is, the church of Christ, the gathering of believers. Because together, and this, uh, underline this, this God and this God alone, amidst a plethora of other commitments and possibilities, and there are many, is worthy of our undivided commitment and allegiance. This Christ who died for us, for sinners, who laid down his life for us, he is worthy of us spending time, setting aside, uh, setting aside time to get together and to worship and to, to love and uh, to learn and to sing his praises. So the church, the gathering, uh, the ecclesia is a God thing. It's Christ's creation. It has a profound purpose. And now it's pretty countercultural. And uh, we'll see what how it looks after COVID-19 settles down. I think it's going to be changed. I, for one, appreciate it much, greatly, when when folks come doggedly and regularly uh, to to meet together to worship. It's, uh, it's 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 great to see. It's a great discipline that you have. But I hope and trust that you are happier. It, it may be it may be doggedly, but but hopefully it's not uh, uh, re regretfully or um, kind of like. It's a great hard duty for you. I hope and trust that you're happier and stronger for it and that you are growing spiritually and that you are loving God and your neighbor more and more because of it. Let's pray. Ah, Lord Jesus, you are the one who created the church and we are, we are, we are that. Your gathering, your sheep, and you are our shepherd. And you've called us to meet together, to be a community, to be a, a family of those who know, who know you, Christ, and who know the Father through you. 
a family of those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to, uh, to know the discipline of getting together, of being with one another, of growing in love by, by uh, rubbing up against one another, even when we rub each other the wrong way. Help us to forgive. Help us to heal our relationships. Help us to be a people of love. By this will all people know that we are your disciples, Jesus, when we have love for each other. And we can't have that unless we, we know each other and get together. So Lord, help us, guide us, strengthen us in our, in our struggle. And Lord, uh, especially in these difficult times, teach us how to do this wisely. We ask it in your name, Jesus Christ our Lord. You who taught us in prayer to say the Lord's Prayer together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing. What are we going to sing? Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our life's wild, restless sea. This one's got the these and thous in it because we like the tune that went with the this words version. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. May you have a wonderful long weekend, rest what remains, and uh, uh, Labor Day weekend, and all the best to uh, you as you continue on your journey with Christ. May he bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us, both now and always. Amen.
Thank you. 